Good evening, a warm welcome and greetings of solidarity to all of you from a, a, a very clearly wintry Cape Town as we connect virtually across different spaces, geographically, um, different uh, disciplinary locations. My name is Shana Safla. I'm affiliated with the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, which is located in the College of Human Sciences at the University of South Africa. And I'm also the current past president of the Psychological Society of South Africa. We really are delighted um, that you have joined us this evening for this webinar. And as I'm saying this, I can see more participants joining us. Um, and tonight's webinar centers the focus on decolonial feminist ethics of care. It's co-hosted by the Institute for Social and Health Sciences and the Decolonizing Psychology Division of the Psychological Society of South Africa. I also would like to acknowledge our friends and colleagues who are on today's program, um, whose rich and dissident contributions and whose resistant voices within the academy and beyond the academy continue to inspire the makings of um, anti-oppressive discourses, anti-oppressive practices, and um, very much decolonial praxis and decolonial futures. With that, I'd like to say a very brief word about the webinar itself. Um, it's based on a panel discussion with scholars located in South Africa, but also various parts of the world, um, centering the relevance of decolonial feminism in pushing back against the, co against the colonial academy. Um, and of course, we know that these enactments of pushing back take place and manifest in, a, in various forms and through various um, modalities. The, uh, the, the webinar seeks to highlight the, the ways in which a decolonial feminist ethics of care has become crucial for the kind of scholarship um, epistemologies that we would like to think of as liberatory. Importantly, it features the ways in which voice, critical voice, agency, and again, I would add critical agency and liberation constitute Ubuntu-centric practices of decolonial feminist scholarship. And our moderator, Dr. Umarji, will, will elaborate um, on the Ubuntu-centric um, approach to this dialogue and, and to the framing of this seminar. So to this end, we have invited panelists, um, again, who I invite, who are, who are located in different disciplines and different institutions based in the global north, based in the global south, to discuss how the objectives of a decolonial feminist ethics of care can help us to reimagine, um, re-envision decolonizing scholarship. I should add that the University of South Africa is celebrating its exceptional, and I'll underline that, exceptional sesquicentennial, and I hope I've said that um, properly, or 150 years this year. And this celebration is, of course, of historic significance to the university, certainly to the continent, and we would add to the world and it commemorates UNISA as Africa's longest serving distance university. Thematically dedicated um, this year or in this period to the vision and the labor for reclaiming Africa's intellectual futures. And so this is a milestone that of course is significant on, on many levels. And in, and in the immediacy of this seminar, of this webinar, it serves as a very pertinent backdrop to the focus of, of the event, to the focus of the dialogue and the conversations that are to come and the, and the presentations as you will hear shortly. So before I introduce the speakers, um, some, some information from us, um, which the, the office has asked me to share with you. Uh, for those of you who are interested in continuous professional development, um, uh, points. This webinar is accredited uh, with two general CPD points, and if you do, do need these points, colleagues, please complete the evaluation form that will be shared in the chat in the last 10 minutes of the webinar um, in order to receive your CPD certificate. Um, some of you have asked, so to 
to confirm that the webinar recording will be made available on the CISA YouTube channel in due course. Um, and then our panelists and our moderator are particularly looking forward to interacting with you, the audience. So please use the Q&A function on this webinar platform to pose your questions and the chat function to share your comments. Um, and we will turn to these um, later this evening. It is then our pleasure to invite um, Prof. Azwi Mavandu Mutsusi from the University of South Africa to offer opening remarks um, to today's event. And I'd like to take a minute or two to introduce Prof. Azwi as she is affectionately, affectionately known to many of us. Prof. Azwi is an established National Research Foundation rated researcher. She is the head of research and graduate, graduate studies at the University of South Africa. Her research focuses on HIV and LGBTIQ+, especially in rural communities. Her focus, I would add, this is important, is not only in research, but Prof. Azwi is very explicitly and actively involved on, uh, in a range of social issues um, through various um, activist engagements. She has published numerous, numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, um, book chapters, and also two books. Prof. Um, Azwi has a passion, and I can attest to this. I've seen it, has a passion for supporting and developing young academics, emerging researchers, which is very much evident in, in her pursuits at the university, uh, an example being the establishment of the postdoctoral incubation program for academics who have just obtained their, um, their doctorates. Over the years, Prof. Azwi has sustained her academic excellence record, um, and, and this we see through her winning several research related awards. So, Prof. Azwi, we really appreciate your stewardship. We thank you for making time in your busy schedule to join us today. And we look forward to your opening message. I will hand over to you and switch off my camera at this point. Good evening, colleagues. And in my day, I just want to hear a voice. <laughs> Good evening, Prof. Good evening. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to just give opening remarks on these uh, special topics. Uh, the decolonial feminist ethics of care. I've been looking at this topic analyzing it and see how loaded it is. We have issues of decoloniality. We have feminist, we have ethics, and we have care. Uh, all those when combined in one bowl, uh, they bring a, a, a windmill wherein you find that when you are dealing with the colonial aspect, uh, you, are, you are tiptoeing on other people's spaces and you are like, you are challenging other people's uh, being and what they think is normal then the moment you want to decolonize it, it becomes an issue. Then also issues of feminists, where we find that uh, feminists themselves, they don't agree on what is it, when they, what is it when they're talking about feminism. Others issues of feminists is focusing on Mm, we don't want men, we don't want oppression, op oppression by men. With other feminists, it means dealing with anything which mm, consider women as superior. 
your ex inferior. But for me, most of the time, I usually say, I'm not a feminist. And people think I'm a feminist and I'm not. I'm a queerist. Uh, why am I saying I'm a queerist? Uh, I, I just want to bring these issues of queerist, which will even include feminist inside, because some of the feminists consider um, their feminism as focusing on issues of not only gender, but also whatever in, uh, leads to people to be oppressed. So that's why I've just decided to say, I am a, a queerist because it's not only, people are not only oppressed, people are not only undermined uh, because of the, the, the gender identity, especially the biological sex, but there are a lot of aspects which make people uh, to be undermined, to be um, judged negatively, to be considered in such a way that they don't, they're not considered as a full woman, human being, but like a lesser human being. So I'm bringing this because when we just say we are going to focus on feminism and our focus is on females, uh, it, it becomes a challenge. Or if we say we are focused on people with feminine behavior, uh, it becomes also a challenge because what about masculine, male, masculine females? Because they are also being oppressed, uh, though they don't identify as a feminine per se, uh, but they're still female. So I'm bringing this uh, controversial idea so that when the they, 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 they coming speakers, those who will be dialoguing, um, discuss the issue, they need to see that it's more broader than just what we are thinking and what we are seeing. Because issues of culture, issues of um, a social background, issues of color, issues of makes uh, the, 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 the females or women experience uh, differently. A, 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 a woman who is in urban and of higher economic status, you find that their experience differ. And when we bring the ethics of care in those situation, we may find that what we think, um, uh, in fact, feminist, of, um, the issues of ethics of care need to be contextual relevant because what you might think is uh, relevant to somebody who is staying in another area might completely not be relevant. And sometimes we find that uh, when we are approaching things from a uh, general or westernized point of view, we, we predispose uh, some people who are in urban area, not urban, a rural area, uh, to, to violence we're seeing on daily basis. Because sometimes when people are coming with ethics of care, it comes as a package which is like it's one size fits all, where some people feel that where they're staying, the way they're behaving, the way they're living, it's normal way of life. And when you want to settle and settle that, thinking that you are decolonizing, you find that you are bringing more and more problem to the situation. Uh, I usually give example, uh, referring to myself, I'm from a rural area in Limpopo, which is far north of South Africa, bordering Zimbabwe, where we find that we usually stick to our cultural practices. And uh, for example, the way we do the greetings in our area, uh, people might have seen me most of the time, when I have to greet, especially people who are older than me, or even if I want to 
uh, to avoid observing protocol of saying uh, the head of institute, this and that and that. I'll just lie on my side and greet. And that's a way of, uh, it's a, a, our normal way of greeting. And somebody can come and say, you are colonized. We want to decolonize it. You are undermined. You are disrespected. And at the end, you find that it unsettles me because what usually happens is uh, um, feminists from certain areas assume that the behavior of feminists from another area is showing, um, what can I say? It, it is showing that you are being undermined, you are being oppressed, you are being, uh, you. they will bring everything where you find that it's feminist judging another feminist uh, who, who are in another context. That's why I say for me, this is, such a controversial topic where we find that there is no right or wrong answer. But the issue of um, whoever is in a situation and if it feels that that situation works for them, uh, I think let's try and support them to say, how do you continue to live with that comfortable and like trying to unsettle uh, the environment, which for others, they feel like we are okay. Uh, this is the way of living and this is self-fulfilling because uh, as psychologists, we, we, we focus on what brings to you or self-actualization. So being where you are, living the way you are, you are living, if it brings self-actualization to you, I think, that's what we need to consider. And that's what we need to respect. By those few words I say, people, I'm giving you the stage, enjoy the discussion. And I think my opening has not made it even simpler, uh, but uh, let's keep on debating. And I'm so grateful for what ISH and in collaboration um, with, um, Saika are doing because I know these debates will assist us because sometimes we find that when we are starting debates based on our own world view, not considering the world view of other people, uh, it is what is bringing a lot of chaos in this world. Uh, thank you and back to you, Prof. Thank you so much, Prof, as we, um, and certainly for those provocations as well. I have no doubt that our panelists will, will engage um, some of the issues that you have raised um, and that you have highlighted for us this evening. Thank you very much again for making time for the, uh, to join us. Um, and now it is my distinct pleasure and my privilege to introduce the webinar panelists Panelists, may I ask you to all switch on your cameras at this point. On the panel today, we are joined by what was meant to be um, uh, five colleagues, five leading scholar activists. Um, regretfully, Professor Shose Kesi is, is ill and is not going to be able to join us. Um, nonetheless, we have colleagues from different parts of the world. Um, you will find in the chat, Mohammed, if you can help us with that, their detailed bios. Uh, and you will also see their profiles on the slides that are going to be screened now. Thank you, Mohammed. What I'd like to do is introduce um, each of them now before I hand over to our moderator for the evening. Um, Huno, don't. Huno, I'm going to start with you. Kuno Jones is an interdisciplinary scholar whose principal interests include political discourses on citizenship, post-colonial migration and, and the nation in the Netherlands, Belgium and the UK, politics of World War II heritage in the Netherlands and its former colonies, the afterlives of colonialism and slavery in the Netherlands, legal histories of conquest, slavery and indenture and European political constructions and regu um, regulations of interracialized intimacies. Um, Kuno sounding really impressive. Thank you for 
sharing your, your profile with us. Um, Fatane Farahani is a professor in ethnology at the Department of Ethnology, History of Religion and Gender Studies at Stockholm University. Her main field of study is migration and displacement. Um, and by integrating ethnographical methodologies and intersectional approaches um, into the heart of, of the migration scholarship, what her work does is extends the theorization of gendered belonging and non-belonging um, in the context of spatial, temporal, cultural, and linguistic mobilities and immobilities. Um, thank you for joining us, um, Fatine. Um, Marina, I'm very pleased that after the technical challenges you experienced that you're able to connect with us this evening. Marina Direct is a feminist anthropologist who works at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at Freya, yes, University of Amsterdam. She has done um, collaborative research in Morocco, Yemen, Ethiopia, and Jordan, and has published extensively on, on her work. Um, she has been involved in very exciting ways in various home projects uh, and is the initiator of the website Lives in Perspective. You might want to check that out with fictive stories of people living, living uh, particularly in conflict within parts of the Middle East and, and Africa. And finally, um, I introduce to you Professor Hugo Canham who is a professor at the Institute for Social and Health Sciences at the University of South Africa, my colleague. Um, his work is located along the fault lines of Black Studies, African Feminism, African Queer Theorizations, and Necropolitics. His work is invested in um, um, the binaries between the human and the natural multi-species world, and may be understood very much within the transdisciplinary rubric of what um, Professor Canham terms Black Planetary Studies. Um, his book titled Writer's Deathscapes is published by Duke University Press and co-published by Wits University this year, recently released. In fact, some of us just attended the Cape Town launch of, the, of Prof. Canham's book. And I can tell you that it is a powerful and an extraordinary book and, and, I, and I encourage you to lay your hands on it. I promise I'm not Professor, Professor Canham's agent um, at all, um, but um, I certainly do. Um, with this, allow me then to introduce the webinar mo moderator who will steer us through the remaining time. She's sitting across the room from me. Um, Nadira um, Umarji is a decolonial feminist scholar working internationally. She is an independent researcher affiliated to the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, but she is also a research associate with the Identity, Diversity and Inclusion Research Group in the Department of Sociology at Freya University, Amsterdam. Her previous book dealt with questions on decolonizing academia by following the student, decolonial student movements in Cape Town and Amsterdam. Um, titled Reimagining the Dream, Decolonizing Academia by Putting the Last First. There's much to be said about Nadiwa's research. Um, I will highlight that her current research interest focuses on decolonial feminist pedagogies with her latest book titled We Belong to the Earth Towards a Decolonial Feminist Inquiry Rooted in Uhuru and Ubuntu. So Nadira, I think we have an exciting two hours, or sorry, not two hours, one and a half hours ahead of us. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to hand over to you to take us through the remaining time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Shana, for that. It's, it's my absolute pleasure to actually welcome all the panelists today. And I'm very much in good company because I can say that. The panelists are my dear friends uh, and uh, even though Hugo I haven't seen for about a decade, Hugo and I work together at Bits University so it's a pleasure to see Hugo online as well. Um, I would like to start off uh, saying a little bit about decolonial, uh, what a decolonial feminist ethics of care means to me. 
and and I have to also say that each and every panelist has been actually used in my scholarship. So I know their work, and it is um, it's very much based on the values or the principles of a decolonial feminist ethics of care. And again, I would like to stress that um, these are these are friends of mine as well, and scholarship for me is about community and it's about building community and it's about recognizing the value that we all bring to scholarship but the value that we bring to each other's lives and and I'm really sorry that Professor Shosi Kesi wasn't able to make it today because a lot of her work is very much rooted in a decolonial feminist ethics of care and she is a co-founder for the hub for de um, decolonial African psychologies at the University of Cape Town, as well as the Dean of Humanities, and has done a lot of this kind of work in a very practical way at, in her uh, deanery. I think it's called deanery or deanship. Yeah. I, I'm so not a, a, a hierarchical person, so I kind of miss all the terminologies that go with it. I think it's a typical um, blocking uh, of not wanting to perpetuate the colonial academy and by actually make dropping all these titles and actually creating a more I a, a more an idea that scholarship is not about hierarchy but learning is a continuous journey and with that I want to actually mention the idea of Ubuntu and the reasons why for me a decolonial feminist ethics of care is rooted in Ubuntu is because it is very much rooted in the idea of recognition that we cannot come into being without the recognition of the other and that recognition is absolutely crucial and vital for our own sense of identity and sense of community in this world and together with Spinoza's idea of an ethics of state it's about how do we create communities which are in harmony? How do we live in harmony with the planet, which is also a living being? How do we recognize across species the, the value of recognition um, in, in that engagement and the relationality in that engagement because we are always creating new ways of being, new imaginaries with each and every engagement. And the other is not actually the other that is over there, but the other is part of the self. And that understanding of the world where the other is part of the self and is a crucial aspect of the self is what we actually do need in our scholarship, what we need in our pedagogical practices, but what we need to take us forward in this particular era where if we are not careful, we will go into extinction. And this is the, the urgency of the matter and the urgency of the need to actually have a decolonial feminist ethics of care, to be able to see the other as a crucial aspect for our survival. And, and it seems kind of like a mercenary way of looking at it, but if you think about it and you think about it rooted in the notions of decolonial love, then it's about extending that love that we have for ourselves and for each other, for our loved ones, but actually extending it to a much larger way of being, a much larger imaginary of how we are in the world today. And with that, it is an absolute pleasure to actually introduce you to one of my dearest, dearest friends, Puno Jones, who actually is a seminal part of my thinking. So when I write, if I don't talk to Huno, I don't write. And so I'm very, very pleased that he is able to uh, join us today. His work is phenomenal. I, a lot of my work relies on his scholarship and his scholarship uh, on the afterlives of slavery, coloniality, indentured labor and apartheid. So thank you, Huno, and welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me um, for your very generous um, your, your generous remarks and uh, and and I I, I hope that um, that that my contribution somehow connects to to the overarching theme. Um, I, 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 it's it's about citizenship, violence, colonial intimacies, and their afterlives. And I will I will say something briefly about the, the, the context uh, with which I'm most familiar, uh, and that is uh, 
uh, colonial uh, the, the the Dutch Empire, uh, the Dutch uh, the Dutch Empire in the Caribbean, and in uh, colonial Indonesia. So, and I very much agree with uh, with what has been said before that we really need to contextualize. Um, um, you know, no, notions of injustice, but also the struggle against injustice. These are really very contextual issues. And um, I have never situated my research explicitly into the, in the decolonial feminist um, perspective, um, but I, I, I certainly, I, I'm, I'm certainly influenced by it. So I, 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 think, I, I hope it, it can be in, um, in, in that sense, uh, yeah, a contribution. Um, so in my work, I, I've, I've looked at how citizenship violence is tied up uh, with Dutch colonial in, with the Dutch colonial intimate order, uh, how these dynamics are intertwined with gender and race, and what are some of the afterlives of, of, of these uh, dynamics. And uh, my work, I think, can be can be understood as a critique of the universalist inclusive conceptions of modern citizenship. Um, and the, this, this, and 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 also as a critique of uh, of the myth of of European intimate free freedom. So um, when you include metropole and colony in one analytical framework, then um, you know these these myths are really um, uh, very problematic and on 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 uh, on, on, on tenable, very problematic. And um, um, the, the 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 talk I, I give today, a very brief talk, is based on a paper that was on uh, Anton de Com. Anton de Com, who was a, a very a seminal anti-colonial thinker, um, a Surinamese uh, Surinamese Dutch thinker who criticized colonialism uh, as as specifically slavery and the afterlife of slavery in terms of indenture, etc. So. Um, I, I will briefly say 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 something about that. Um, take issue with this this notion of um, uh, modern citizenship and legal citizenship. Uh, sorry, modern law and legal citizenship as inaugur inaugurating a more equal phase in the history of humanity, and the the notion that Europe is the birthplace of uh, the um, intimate freedom. Um, and instead, I will uh, uh, briefly uh, address the role of European empires in the formation of hierarchical, violent, exploitative, unfree, social, legal, and uh, intimate orders in the colonies, and uh, and and how this perspective is really denied in the scholarship uh, in, in in the Netherlands. So I work from a situated conception of citizenship and intimacies. Um, Instead of asking what these dominant uh, universalist inclusive and progressive conceptions of citizenship and intimacies can tell about the lives of the colonized, we should, I think, ask what the lived experiences and perspectives of the colonized reveal about the unacknowledged and violent formative shadows of modern citizenship and, 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 and intimacies. And um, one of the critical voices that uh, has has been um, uh, very instructive in my thinking is Anton de Com, and I uh, reread Anton de Com uh, from the perspective of 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 uh, uh, you know uh, 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 diasporic positioning. Anton de Com was an activist uh, a writer, uh, an anti-colonial activist writer. Uh, his one of his most uh, you know a, a seminal work that has recently be can be, be canonized. Uh, is canonized in the Netherlands is We Slaves of Suriname, Wij Slaven van Suriname. It was a book that was written in Dutch. It's good to keep in mind that the anti-colonial critique in um, Suriname was articulated in Dutch, but also in San Antonio. Uh, and um, it was for a very long time, the work was ignored. It was overlooked and um, uh, just, just like Anton de Com, uh, it, was, was kind of like, it was considered a a, a um, uh, you know literature that uh, that 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 should be uh, um, you know kept out of the curriculum. Um, so in Wijslaven van Suriname, Anton de Kom uh, criticizes. Uh, he looks back. He looks back at slavery. Uh, it's sort of not so long after the end of slavery. 
he criticizes the uh, the phenomena of slavery, indentured labor, and capitalist exploitation. He was inspired by colonial by uh, 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 communism, and um, that is really uh, uh, you know a, a threat in his book and in his thinking. What uh, Anton de Kom did, I, I reread Anton de Kom from the perspective of what he uh, says about uh, citizenship. And he, he demonstrates in Wijslaven van Suriname how um, slavery provided the context in which uh, European citizens could articulate their property rights as elements of civic rights via enslaved bodies. And he shows how property rights in the colonial setting of Suriname were about the commercial sale and maximum exploitation of enslaved bodies and how um, the, this right, uh, property rights, was sol solemnly protected even when European rulers changed and how slave owners view torture and random executions as enslaved bodies, of enslaved bodies as inherent to their property rights. So this is a very different notion of what the meaning of the law and the meaning of citizenship is. Uh, he, in, in his work, he reveals the violence of citizenship, citizenship violence, as it manifested in the colonial setting. Uh, what is interesting is that um, his work is also trailblazing in that he was sensitive to gender. And uh, he dem this is 19 1934, in which he wrote the book. Uh, and uh, already in that book, he demonstrates intersectional awareness in the language of today. And he observes in Wijslaven van Suriname, we slave Suriname, the double exploitation of enslaved women as plantation laborers and sexual objects. And he, um, and he, he uh, you know, he, he, he analyzes this. I cannot read out the, the quotes because of uh, limited time. Um, but what comes uh, to the fore is uh, citizenship violence as, a, as gendered sexual violence towards female enslaved bodies in, a patri in the patriarchal colonial context. And he, he demonstrates how the institution of marriage uh, offered legal benefits and was imbued with, with, with notions of respectability. Uh, this 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 institution of marriage was reserved for uh, European uh, uh, women with European citizenship status. So enslaved women were excluded from this notion of um, respectable, uh, you know, uh, uh, citizenship. So European men and European women were differentially positioned in these dynamics. Like the situation in the metropole, the cult of true European womanhood was also a patriarchal formation in the colonies, but in plantation society, it was a much more complex formation. While European women as citizens were allowed to explicitly articulate their property rights regarding enslaved bodies, they did not enjoy the same sexual prerogatives as European men. Uh, the work of authors such as Gloria Wecker reveals how European women met with severe punishment uh, when they acted as active sexual agents by entering into sexual relationships with black men. Uh, the, 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 the white women who entered into these relationships were abandoned, they were expelled from the colony, whereas the black men would be killed. White men, on the other hand, uh, could normally combine relationships with their white spouses and black con concubin concubines, and uh, and this was really a normalized phenomenon. So this is uh, this was part of a much broader pat pattern in the um, in, in in the Dutch Empire. You can see similar patterns on Curacao, and that is what the work of Angela Rowe was all about. Was, was is is about, uh, but also in uh, colonial Indonesia, as the work of as uh, Reggie Bai demonstrates. So citizenship violence as gendered sexual violence towards female enslaved bodies in the patriarchal colonial context. Uh, however, this was not the way dominant historiography made sense of these relationships. And this is uh, where um, I think Angela Rowe made a, a, a very um, uh, important observations about the ways in which um, the, 
in, in the historio historiographical accounts of these interracialized intimacies uh, that they were constructed in the absence of women and men of color. And, um, and, and as a result, the historiography on the Dutch Caribbean tends to suggest the consensual nature of these interracialized intimacies, while sexual violence and exploitation of women of color is silenced. Uh, and it could be argued that the romanticization of sexual violence in knowledge production is a form of epistemic violence. And we can, uh, you know, we, we, we can ask, I think we can ask the question whether this is still the case, eh? whether what are the intimacies of these, these, um, this, this epistemic uh, violence, eh? this, uh, this romanticization of sexual violence. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I don't know how, how many minutes I still have, uh, but uh, um, there are some very, uh, I think, uh, pressing afterlives of this formation. If you think, uh, uh, of, for instance, of the hierarchies that were uh, created through the institution of citizenship and that were created through the differential treatment of the uh, mixed offspring of European men and um, colonized women, and how this really um, uh, was part of the formation of, of colorist uh, social structures throughout the Caribbean, uh, throughout uh, the South America and North America. And these pigmentocracies, as Stuart Hall uh, would, would, uh, um, would call it, are still with us today. So this, 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 this is, I think, very important that um, you know this 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 intimate order became part of a of of a, a racialized hierarchical social order that is really about um, you know um, yeah, about these pigmentocracies eh? and, and and how they and and this is we we, we have seen a, a, a decolonial critique that takes issue with. Um, you know the the inherent inherent the the, the 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 legacies of colonialism, but still uh, society is permeated by these racialized dynamics, and I think it's it's good to stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bruno. You had so much to say in that, um, specifically around you know violences and silences and the romanticization of sexual violence, which are all. The, part of the hangovers of, you know, the viol the brutality of colonialism, which still, you know, regenerates itself um, in, in today's society as part of the afterlives of slavery. And I think that it's always important, especially for countries like South Africa that have a very high rate of gender-based violence to actually understand where some of this gender-based violence is rooted. Um, and as Gloria Vecca, you know, says, it's part of the, you know, part of the coloniality of gender, which is this kind of unbridled sexual abuse that comes with it as well. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm looking forward to um, a lot of the comments that will generate from the Q&A um, after all the panelists speak. But I would like to actually turn to Fartene um, in Sweden, in Stockholm. And um, I have to say that I love Vatanez's work as well. She writes a lot on hospitality and it is a lot of that is also um, in my latest book as well, because the ideas of how, how do we actually look at migrants and refugees in, in you know, provincial Europe, um, not with the idea of gratitude, but really with the idea of value for for people coming in and the ways in which they contribute towards those societies. So thank you, Fatane, for joining us. Janam, you're- Sorry. You're, yeah. nah. <laughs> thank you so much to everyone, to all the organizers, particularly my dearest Nadira, who has included me to this wonderful panel. Uh, I would like to start by sharing the screen. Let me see. Okay, do you see the screen? Let me see where I am. So better to start from the beginning. So uh, I have the same concern as Dr. Uh, John started uh, to, I'm not sure how much uh, what I'm going to share with you is going to, 
uh, to talk and correspond with uh, with the topic but uh, i certainly uh, myself think that that is a kind of i have uh, been inspired and influenced by the colonial feminists uh, and the way that the colonial feminists approach the concept of care but what i have decided to share with you today is mostly about uh, my personal slash academic experiences as a diasporic researcher and the type of vulnerability that I always have uh, felt uh, working within the uh, different diasporic space and carrying different type of history and different type of uh, power relationship that uh, I have to deal with both in regard to um, in regard to my home countries, uh, my one of my home countries, Iran, and then my diasporic uh, life and serial immigration in different contexts. So I would like to start by one of the uh, scholars that I have been mostly inspired by, uh, Bell Hooks, that I know that all of you know very well. Uh, and what I like about uh, Hooks is that uh, she is one of the scholars who openly talk about the pain uh, and how in whole her work she's talking about the, how her intellectual journey is shaped uh, by embodiment of pain. Uh, and in this presentation, I would like to kind of talk about how I identify the pain that I carry through my own uh, both personal and academic history, which I don't actually distinguish them. I don't see them as a dichotomist uh, and how not only identify the pain, communicate the pain, and um, how I can in best way communicate the pain. And I have to move your beautiful faces here so I can see the whole, <laughs> uh, and how I can communicate the pain, how I can raise concern through communication of pain. And uh, by raising, car, uh, raising uh, concerns, in my view, I can raise awareness about what our lives is about. And since, you know, for most of uh, most of us, you know, we are, uh, it's not about the intersectional analysis, it's about talking about intersectional pain that we are experiencing through different power relationship that our life is shaped by. Uh, so one of the uh, sentences of bell hooks that I always carry with me, as I guess no other sentences in whole my academic work has, has had an impact on me in such a profound way that this sentence had. I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. I saw in theory a location of healing. So for me, just, you know, I mean, that, that says, you know, what I, why I'm in the academy, because I want to talk about pain. And and just for people who not only just, you know, of course, many, very few people nowadays talk about objective research, but people still try to package that, the kind of distance that I don't want to talk about my personal story. And nowadays, of course, I want to talk about my personal story because that is a look, that is a location I see the world. And I don't want to remove that. And that is, a, and for me, working on that is my theoretical work and is a location of healing, both the location of to see the world and the location to heal and hopefully to be able to communicate. So where I'm coming from, in my work, you know, I started my years ago, my PhD and later on uh, my postdoc on what I call is sexuality or migration. I look at how uh, Iranian men and women sexuality is constructed through the so-called Iranian culture, Islam as one or two, two, two factors, and then how their life kind of, you know, shaped in the diaspora context. So my question, I have tried to understand the migratory experience through the lens of gender and sexuality, how the reason, the process, and the condition of arrival for these men and women has been shaped through the lens of gender and sexuality. So men and women experiences, both the reason, the process, and the outcome or condition of living has been very much gendered. 
And my question has, my research question for both cases have been, what constitute, what constitute the desirable heterosexual feminine or masculine subject in the Iranian context and how and why, why that, and how that changes when they come, for instance, to Sweden or any other diasporic space. One of the reasons that I choose sexuality as my analytical concern has been, as many of you know, that the sexuality has always been used as a signifier for civilization and has been a part, a very important part of the colonial discourses in order to present themselves as a civilized and the other one as the uncivilized. So for me, it has been important that for the Iranian men and women who have been living both with the uh, Orientalist discourses and Occidentalist discourses, how their sexuality and their gender identity has been shaped through those different discourses. And in doing that, I always had to, to deal with different kind of discourses, both in terms of the home countries, cultural upbringing, religious upbringing, and what they come. So when they come to, for instance, Sweden or any other context. So in my own personal life, as I said, that I'm going to be quite personal here, just has been always shaped of uh, event uh, happening that shaped my life as a before and after. I cannot uh, see myself or understand my life or even imagine how would my life would look like if the Iranian revolution didn't happen in 1979. I don't know how my life would look like and what kind of person I have been if I didn't meet, uh, came to Sweden as a refugee when I was a 90 years old uh, woman. Uh, I don't know, you know what would happen to my life if I didn't do this and that migration, serial migration that I have done in my life. Uh, and of course, you know what happened with uh, Mahsa Amini uh, last summer, September 16, when she was uh, killed in Iran brutally by the uh, Iranian moral police because she didn't uh, respect the proper veiling. So all this happening just has an impact on me as an Iranian so-called Muslim scholars in the diasporic space and how my diasporic position is constructed with those different uh, happening that um, that uh, always shape my scholarly position. So that's why I cannot find a moment in my scholarly life that my personal experiences in all the process, when I teach, when I apply for funding, when I interview people, when I'm interviewed by the journalists, through the whole experiences, I feel my personal uh, life or the way that people look, think that my personal love, life looked like is always has an impact on that. That's why I just cannot imagine that, you know, I, or I cannot distinguish my personal life from an academic life. And honestly, I think that's the case for everyone. But as you know, just when it's a white middle-class woman or man, they don't think about that because that's a normative position that they don't think that of also their experience is also shaped by their position. So in my work, having said that, I just wanna, my approach to the decolonial feminist or care is that to how I, in my, in my, I just I have to move this picture in order to be able to see them all the images. So how I have in all my academic life, I have been in kind of in a scholarly minefield since you know whatever I say, whatever I do is a kind of you know uh, wrong or I have been too concerned in order to uh, not do anything that uh, gives space to the Islamophobic uh, discourses that exist in the Europe. At the same time, myself and all the women and men I have interviewed, their life is shaped by the uh, Islamic government have come to uh, Sweden or any other country in Europe by the impact of the uh, government that has uh, led to that, you know, the 
families have been killed, you know, they have gone through a lot of, you know, uh, very dramatic uh, event in their life. And how am I supposed to tell the story that actually can be uh, loyal to all of these complicated stories. So one of the things that, you know, when you are within the European um, scholarly system, but the, the, the impact of compulsory Eurocentrism that allow just for one specific story, you cannot, you know, just having different type of story. There is an epistemic habit that allow just one specific type of working, one specific type of writing, and who has the epistemic entitlement to, to do research on whom at the same time having owning the epistemic ignorance that when is my job to always save the information, save the knowledge to people who never care to learn anything. They still you know, mix up Iran and Iraq, two, 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 two countries that was in war in eight years. So it is my job to always give the information. And as I mentioned, earlier in a shifting Islamophobic context. I mean, when Gina Amini was killed during the last couple of or seven, eight months, I have been in many places and talk about what's happening in Iran and how my work has been about the Iranian women body and sexuality kind of, and everything I have written about the veil and all these things have become important all of a sudden. And one of the things that has happened that people keep asking me, why don't you go and burn your way. I said, you probably don't realize that I don't have a veil. And even if I had a veil, why should I go and burn it in Syria? I mean, if Iranian women burn it, they do that in the very specific political context, which is completely different. Why should I do that? And then people, no Muslim women is allowed to go in Swedish uh, street without being afraid that are, you know, uh, facing, you know, racist attack. Or, you know, when they are asking, uh, most of the time they, the journalists call me and said, I don't know anything about Iran. I said, so why are you calling me? So I cannot imagine that, you know, uh, in whole my academic life, that I would dare to call to someone and say, I don't know anything about that, just inform me. So who has the privilege to carry kind of epistemic ignorance at the same time require that you are the one who should learn me and you should be even thankful. I mean, relating to what Nadira, you said that this kind of the concept of, you know, uh, you always be thankful because you want to write two lines about what happened in Iran and I have to give you all the information and then you write about that. So in that specific context, when you always should kind of negotiate between this, you know, ignorance that's going on and at the same time, you should be, kind of thankful because probably uh, the media pay a bit attention to what you are going to do. At the same time that there is a, uh, for the marginalized community who always feel that, you know, their concern is not, uh, you know, a part of the news, a part of what's happening. So when you are there, you have the judgmental eyes of the community as well because they expect you to, that you are their voice. At the same time, you know, the community is a very heterogeneous community. How are you supposed in three minutes time that you get in the media at the six o'clock in the morning to be able to cover all this issue? So that type of, you know, epistemic vulnerability that puts you in the position that you always should kind of find a way to uh, challenge that single story that is. At the same time, while this happening is, if, we are, if you, I have time, I would like to talk, talk about, you know, the troubling concept of solidarities, that, you know, how we can decolonize sol solidarity in kind of empirically, methodologically, and conceptually. Who are we working with? Who want to so show our solidarity with? What methodology and method we are using? And what are the you know common terms that we are supposed to to be in the same context and be so, be solidaris? 
And that is something that I have realized through the, what is happening in all these years, my kind of diasporic life, particularly during the last eight months, at the same time that you should be thankful if there are two white women who comes to our demonstration and want to show the solidarity of what's happening to Iranian women, why they have been kind of you know, raising one of the most important feminist movement through or modern time. So that type of you know, aspect that I think is very important. I guess I see from Nadira your, that I I don't have more time. So I guess I stop here and maybe if I come back when we have a discussion. Thanks, Bartone. I um you know, as always, your your work is so provocative and mm -hmm. makes me grow so much every single time that I engage with your work. And mm -hmm. I always reflect on it much later. And I mean, again, mm -hmm. you know, epistemic and uh, vulnerability in scholarship is something we don't really talk much about, but we mm -hmm. all experience as scholars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pain, a lot of our scholarship is based on our own trauma mastery, wanting to mm. understand things mm. better so that we can also for ourselves be able mm. to resolve those issues. And I mean, I think psychologists are mm. best located uh, to talk about that mm. as well. You know, mm. why do people go into psychology mm. um, or psychoanalysis or any mm. of these uh, disciplines? Mm. So thank you so much, Fatane, mm -hmm. for a very thought provoking um, uh, presentation. I it it is my absolute pleasure to invite my friend Marina, who I love very dearly, um, to actually speak about um, about her scholarship and and one of the things that I love about her scholarship is that it's based on epistemic vulnerability and the ways in which, as a researcher friendship, the ways in which friendship gets mobilized in her own research and how you cannot actually keep that objective distanciation that have, that you're supposedly uh, uh, asked to do in the Colonial Academy. And so I, I, it's with great pleasure that I invite Marina to speak about her research. And, oh, Thank and you. I have to say, I'm very sorry, Marina. <laughs> I oh. told her not to do a PowerPoint and then Fartan did one. And I'm so oh, sorry. It's about fine. That. Sorry, I it's didn't a, that I shouldn't do that. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I did. I I thought it had to go into the yeah. um, organizers to put it up on their platform and they would control it. I am very sorry. This is my no mistake. No problem. <laughs> so uh, can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, thank you so much, Nadira, for inviting me on this panel. This is very special. Uh, as as well, I'm I'm a, a white scholar from from the Netherlands, uh, and maybe yeah, therefore a little bit in a yeah maybe vulnerable position. <laughs> but I I do I embrace vulnerability. And I am sitting in my kitchen. Uh, I have some problems with my laptop. And Nadira knows my kitchen very well because she takes care of me when she stays with me and she cooks for me in this kitchen. Uh, it's a bit, but I can see all of you. So I think everything is working well. And I'm happy I don't have PowerPoint because otherwise I had to share it through my phone and I don't know how to do that. Anyways, I'm going to share a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, my, yeah, some reflections about myself and my discipline, uh, which is anthropology, and it relates to what Professor Fatina uh, has been sharing already. Uh, and of course, she speaks from a very different point of view from, and I speak from, yeah, the point of view of, in fact, a Dutch woman and, and when I started studying uh, anthropology, a, a Dutch young woman who uh, was extremely interested in, in anthropological issues. And I, I want to go very yeah, quickly, a, a bit like Professor Fatima, uh, uh, or Fatima uh, 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 yeah, through my own career and how and why I center friendship. And I think this relates very much to this debate that we're having here. 
I consider myself a feminist anthropologist and that's already from decades ago from when I was a student. Uh, I was very much bra kind of uh, raised as a feminist anthropologist in the, yeah, the idea that we want to do research, well, about, but especially with and for women and bring about social change. But I was also an anthropologist that wanted to go out there, so to other parts of the world, which I found much more interesting than my own uh, society. And now reflecting on it, I sometimes call myself like a feminist orientalist at that time. Um, and I, I did research in Morocco, you said it in the beginning, uh, but I was really very frustrated about it research. I was very young, I was very lonely. I was really questioning what I was doing. So my reflection here is also quite methodological, like how do we relate? Yeah, how do we do research? What do we find important? And I think in anthropology, it has for a long time be, uh, the idea that we go somewhere, especially European Western, yeah, anthropology, um, colonial anthropology, <laughs> of course, uh, go somewhere to a society that's different from ours, where we get to know people, build up relationships, friendships, and use those contexts to, well, to get to know or get answers to questions uh, that we found important. And I think what I like of feminist anthropology is that it questioned already this very much in the 70s and the 80s. And, and, and that is why decolonial feminism is extremely important uh, also in, my, uh, in, my, in, my, in the way I do anthropology or research now. And uh, so Morocco was difficult uh, and I question, had many ethical questions and I really felt uncomfortable building up relationships for the sake of collecting so-called data. And um, that was I, still the idea, like it was quite instrumental how we or anthropologists went about friendships and relationships, not romantic relationships, but connections with people and, and I have always found it very troublesome. Uh, I went after this master research to Yemen to another, well, part of the Middle East Arab world uh, to work in a development project. And there I felt extremely useful and relevant uh, because I was doing something with for women. I was working with Yemeni women and I built up also friendships with with women and I was being there was for me the most yeah, important thing. And, and some of my colleagues or anthropology friends would say, why are you taking notes or are you writing down things? No, I didn't want that. It was not what I was interested in. But then I came back to the Netherlands and I did a PhD, a critical uh, study on, on the development projects I worked in, also because I increasingly started to criticize development aid. And I really, really didn't want to work in that field anymore. Also a very colonial or imperial uh, yeah, uh, sector, uh, 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 the development sector. Um, and yeah, after that, I have to say that I have been doing, in the, and that Nadira also said, I've been doing collaborative research, but not so much in Yemen, because as we all know, in Yemen, a war broke out 10 year, almost 10 years ago, which extremely, yeah, well, which is a very extreme, uh, Lee, what is it? Uh, 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 yeah, difficult situation. Uh, and, which confronted me with questions how to relate to my friends in Yemen and of course also questions about how to do research and whether I still wanted to do research and I, I if we talk about trauma I'm I'm not traumatized but I'm very oh well, we're maybe all traumatized but I have been going through yeah a lot but not 
comparable to what people in Yemen go through, but struggling how to relate to people in a war zone and people that I love and that I hold very dearly. And I want to write about it, but I can't, I couldn't because it was just too, too difficult. And I co couldn't go to Yemen. It's, it's really in a, a country, a foreigner, well, maybe some humanitarian aid workers can go to, but not a researcher anymore. So how to relate, how to deal with that? And one solution for me was to do collaborative work, but not in Yemen. I did research as Nadira mentioned in, in Ethiopia, in Jordan, but I felt a very strong concern and responsibility to, 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 yeah, to, 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 to relate to Yemen and to my friends. And one of the things that I started doing is uh, writing about my friendships and in fact, the women that I I am most closely yeah, uh, uh, involved with in their lives are women that do not have men, that are divorced widows, women that I was already very closely yeah, friends with when I lived in Yemen and that have become much more closer, but very different ways because now, and, and it's a continuous question like how and what should I do? Uh, in the in the balance, in fact, I, I have been writing about it. The balance of the friendship has been disturbed because they cannot. Friendship is often seen as something that is kind of, yeah, an equilibrium, a balance. Uh, well, the reciprocity in a friendship is often balanced, but in this way, it's very unbalanced. They they need well not only care, they need attention, but they also need money. And I've been writing about that too. And what I want to say about this ethics, this feminist ethics of care, I think it's, it's very, very difficult. It's continuously thinking what is good. And I don't know what is good. I'm, I'm also reflecting on that, like I'm sending money to friends and so, but it's 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 endless and and I cannot solve the problem. But there's some and and I have in one of my first articles I was saying yeah we should continue doing that and then sometimes I think no I shouldn't do that. While in anthropology you also have to say giving money is really something that has been very ne negatively always portray been portrayed like you do don't do that. Uh, that's like almost like buying your so-called data. While I really think, well, this is an, a situation in which, yeah, to be that principle and say, I don't do that. That means really that my, my friends will be starving. So, um, yeah, I don't know how many minutes I, or, or if I have been talking uh, for, for a long time. Um, I think this is, yeah, so, so I, I think this is the main point that I wanted to make. Uh, reflecting on yeah on positionality and on inequality on on responsibility and the end yeah maybe the last thing I want to say is that I noticed that in fact I'm more and more uh, what is it uh, not yeah moving away from what is called research or what is maybe seen as academic research and I I really care more about people than I care about research. So this is, I, and I feel it also emotionally that I'm distancing myself and that I'm not anymore that interested in, in doing, and also that kind of writing. I'm also thinking of or, and, and trying out different types of writing, which much more, which will be much more closer to, yeah, to what I feel and, and, and what I wanna, yeah. What I wanna, what I also think more people should know than just a small group of academics that may find it interesting. Anyway, that's it, uh, Nadira. I stop okay, here. Well, Marina. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much for that because I, you know, I, I I really do appreciate your research a lot, and and especially the questions and the the ways in which you foreground also that you're a white woman doing research in places like Yemen or not being able to enter Yemen any longer, but wanting to still, you know, the fact that you have uh, friends that you love and care for very deeply who are in Yemen. Um, 
And how do you not do extractive research? And how do you create reciprocal relationships? I think those are those are always questions that we have as researchers and that we always have to question our own positionality in those relationships as well. And I think that that's really crucial. And that of course brings it back to the question around a decolonial feminist ethics of care and how do you apply that in the context of research? And the, I don't think there are any easy answers to these questions. I think we can only problematize them more and more as we, kind of think through them and I think that this is again this this platform is again about thinking through some of these questions how do we do you know um, ethical epistemic uh, with the epistemic integrity uh, research that questions the colonial academy as well and the ways in which research has been set up in the colonial academy um, so so thank you very much for that Marina um, it is again uh, my pleasure to invite Hugo and I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to make it to the University of Cape Town for your book launch today, but everybody's been raving about it. I've seen all the social media posts um, um, in Joburg and now in Cape Town. So, and it's so nice to see you after about 10 years, Hugo. And one of the things that I loved about Hugo's research when I was um, introduced to it 10 years ago was that Hugo made a very brave um, leap to actually criticize the ways in which Black people police Blackness and perpetuate colonialism as well. And, and that was, that gave me, that was such a, um, such a joy to see that because we know that that happens. We know that colonialism doesn't just happen, that it's actually, there's systems in place that allows for these systems of domination to perpetuate, and that often the coloniality of being is part of that perpetuation. So with great pleasure, hi Hugo, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Najira, uh, um, for those kind words. Thank you to Shanaz, and thank you for making the space for this engagement. Um, thanks to my fellow pa panelists too, from whom I've learned a great deal and whose work I will also be turning to. So, like everyone has begun, maybe this does not fit the brief. It is a brief history that I want to give of a little known figure in the footnotes of history. Um, I want to tell the story of Clara Jemena Tsele to illustrate the debt that knowledge owes uh, the black colonial past. Since South African history and theory often begin with apartheid, I believe that a decolonial feminist ethic should invest in excavating our emulated pasts uh, go, going back further. So in uh, my recently published work to which you've referred, I focus on obscure um, on obscure black histories and read them as queer feminist and imaginative archives of black uh, black life. Specifically, I turn to the story of Clara Jomina Tele, born in 1890 and who died in 1913, a, a brief life. This life uh, has been recorded from the perspective of European missionaries, but received almost no critical attention. Tele was a young woman who in 1906 was reportedly possessed by evil spirits. Brian, William, uh, Brian Levick provides some version of the story, and there is almost no complete account apart from one on Wikipedia, uh, which of course is always beset by its own problems. My account is based on a reading across a few texts. Lele is said to have been possessed when she was 16 years old, um, a schoolgirl at St. Michael's Mission in Umzindo, Natal, South Africa. She was a 16 year old orphan and when she experienced her first episode, she was Zulu speaking and of mixed parentage. She reportedly entered into a pact with Satan and this caused a demonic possession. Thaler later revealed this information we hear from her confessor, Father Horner Erasmus. 
In an account by a nun, Tele was said to speak languages that she had no previous knowledge of. This was also witnessed by others who reported that she understood uh, Polish, German, French, and all other languages. The nun reported that Tele demonstrated clairvoyance by revealing the most intimate secrets and transgressions of people with whom she had had no contact. Uh, she could also not bear the presence of blessed objects and seemed imbued with an extraordinary uh, strength and ferocity, often hurling nuns about the convent rooms and beating them up. She was also said to levitate horizontally. Uh, Young reports that the exor exorcism was witnessed by six priests and monks, 14 nuns and 150 inhabitants of the mission station. The nun reported that Zella's cries had a savage bestiality that astonished those around her. That she sounded like a pride of lions from Kenya. In an account of an attending nun, it is apparent that she is seen as a righteously queer body that is so evil that a story has traveled over a century. On this journey, the account has gathered myth and evocation. However, Black girl studies teach us to read Black girls attentively since their lives and voices tend to be suffocated in the archive. There is no account, for example, of Ella's parents, her death, their deaths, or the whereabouts of her extended kin. It is unclear why a 22-year-old woman would die of a heart attack, for example. So Blyji, who wrote at this time, from him we learn that this period was one of mass dispossession, displacement, and early death with the order of the day for Black people. In this moment, a different kind of mourning would have been heavy in the air. Nothing in addition is said about the conditions of and disciplining strictures within the convent. In other words, the conditions that produce volatile erupting bodies are silenced in favor of a redemptive narrative where missionaries save a young black woman from being totally eviscerated by evil and a background of scandalous miscegenation. Tele though was not alone in her possession. According to Young, during her second exorcism in March, 1907, two girls, Monica Maletje and Engelberta also made a pact with the devil and were exorcised. exorcised. Like the girls, in the present Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal eruptions a century later, the girls of Umzindo moved together. In the face of an archive that has failed young women of Umzindo, through a methodology that I'm terming Ugwakumkanya, uh, that is a view of looking at the world from a grounded position, I try to look beyond the factual in order to reconsider the worlds of Tele. Moletcha and Engelberta. As queer subjects of modernity, I suggest that we imagine these young women as aspiring to freedom under pressure of religious institutionalization and colonialism. They are analogous to today's adolescent women who riot against societal surveillance. Tele, Moletcha, and Engelberta might be read as a troika of women who enter into a queer feminist pact. They riot in unison disorient temporality, grasp at pleasure, and queerly erupt the triumph of good over evil. While we are told that Taylor's exorcism was successful, when reading against the grain, we see that it was a continuous um, revolt that, con that formed a chorus when joined by other young women. Looking beyond the factual enables a queer feminist imaginary that authorizes us to think of the young woman as sexual beings who invest in erotic flight within the confines of a colonial Catholic mission station. If we dare, we can consider them as a threesome who took pleasure where they could. In this way, we might see them as jumping in Fred Moulton's break or Franz Fanon's breach. Perhaps they generated and shared pleasure with each other with a lineage of women who were denied desire before them if we attend on a queer frequency, we may feel the reverberations of desire echo down the corridors of time. We too are invited to leap in the queer breach. 
In this conception, the queer formation of Kupuga is his way. We might see possession as the emergence of multiple worlds as it's understood in Xhosa culture. This enables brief surgeons of fugitive frictions and un unknowable intimacies that leave adolescents exhausted when they re-emerge into this world, having participated in other worlds. The periods of hysteria uh, in, in uh, inverted commas uh, point to extant societal tensions and entanglements between the past, present, and future. Uh, the concept of spirituality of survival connotes the turn to metaphysical power or spirituality when people are traumatized by failed systems. Uh, uh, Young suggests that Tzele's eruption could be interpreted in relation to her animistic culture rather than the demonic. Reading Tzele in relation to animism and failed systems compels us to recognize the sexual abuse by an older woman, for example, within the strictures of broader structures of colonialism, patriarchy, oppressive religiosity, and the arrangements of death that rendered her an orphan. Um, I, I have more to say about that, but I'm going to stop in the interest of observing time with uh, the suggestion that there are multiple ways in which we might read spirit position historically and in the present and what they do to our conceptions of temporality uh, and the ways in which we might attend, for example, to Tzele's sonic and visual performances at her exorcism, uh, exorcism as an illustration of an unsettling of the human, right? And dismantling between the putatively human and natural worlds, the spiritual and animal worlds. She was seen as a pride of lions, in, in, in relation to her, her voice. She could speak multiple languages, presumably. Um, what does taking seriously some of these narratives and questioning them with the life worlds of people, indigenous people in their uh, spaces enable in opening a multiplicity of worlds and how young women kick back at these worlds, at, at, at colonial strictures and structures through for example, these possessed eruptions. Thank you. I really feel very, very bad that I didn't make it today because that was such a rich um, imaginary that you've just pulled on there. Thank you, Hugo, for uh, you know queer subjectivity and pushing back against colonialism and Christian uh, values that came to the continent with colonialism and the ways in which it erased or um, disrupted, you know, the the spiritual um, the, the spirituality that comes with African identity as well um, and ancestors, etc. So that that was that was just beautiful. Thank you, thank you very much, and I look forward to reading your book but also around pleasure as revolution and as epistemic disobedience. And we see a lot of that also in the ways in which Fanon suggests, you know, pleasure as epistemic disobedience as well, because the whole idea of colonialism was to manage um, the human not to be able to be too pleasured, um, but to be, be stuck in a, in, a, in a condition of unhappiness, which is ultimately the colonial condition and these pushbacks are, uh, you know, historical pushbacks, are, are, they're just beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. So thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to actually um, open the floor now to our participants uh, in, in the chat rooms to actually ask uh, your questions to our panelists. Um, we have actually, we have a, um, we have a question by Mojaki Gloria, by Gloria, by Mojaki Gloria Makuza, who writes, this conversation triggers me to ask about the confusion of the role of modern women growing up in a context of cultured women. How does a modern woman navigate their role as a woman in a cultured society of women without being critical and judgmental to cultured ways that seem oppressive to oneself? 
Um, and, and this question is to all panelists and anybody who actually would like to engage with the question. Can I say something? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so, sorry. I, if, if I may, I would like to respond to that question. Sure. Fatane, do you want to put your camera on? It seems that I cannot. You cannot start your video because <laughs> the, host, the host has stopped me. <laughs> start my video. Okay, now. Uh, I, I, actually, I was reading that question and it interested me a lot since uh, I, when I interviewed Iranian women uh, about their sexuality, that was something that kind of came up. And I personally have a bit problem with just, you know, being cultured or being uh, traditional or being modern. I don't see that as a dichotomy that, you know, you turn from the traditional religious woman, for instance, to a modern subject. I see that, you know, you can be both of them at the same time and the interesting things when I interviewed Iranian women was that you know when they were kind of talking about their traditional upbringing and patriarchal Iranian culture and I kind of raise up that you know because they were talking about their Iranian culture as something static homogeneous and when I said but you didn't do that why why do you talk about Iranian culture as something that is kind of fix and never changing. And most of them, they were saying, but I am exception. So there is a kind of narrative about, you know, some culture that is never changing. And that narrative is kind of accepted even by some of the individual in the culture, as you know, people call it self-orientalization or self-colonialized, that, you know, you start to take the image that is about you as a Iranian woman, Muslim woman, African woman. And, and if you do that differently, it just you see that I'm exception, or as they say that, you know, like I have heard it many times, you have become Swedish, you have become Western. And by saying that, you say that, okay, you cannot be an Iranian woman at the same time being feminist at the same time being independent the only way for you to become an independent woman to become a feminist is that you become western so that's what i'm saying that you know just you know but considering that how you know you can be um, as uh, i guess one of the panelists was talking about that there is a multiple ways to even go back and look at the spiritual texts, religious texts, you know, all these things, that there are that different type of reading and people kind of uh, cut and paste and do their own kind of uh, subject position in regard to religion, in regard to tradition, in regard to modernity and all these things. But that's my response to that question. I hope I understood, understood that correctly. Thanks, Fatane. Um, Hugo, how, how do you feel about um, responding to that question? I'm, I'm actually just asking you because I think that um, your work speaks to that as well, that question as well. Sorry, I, I hadn't, I, I hadn't thought. Uh... <laughs> to respond and I, I'm listening to Fatima and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm in total agreement and recognition of, of this, I, this idea that we are never exclusively one or the other modern subjects or, or cultural subjects and that we move between these spaces. Um, and that not just people like us that are, are scholars, for example, or, or even middle class, but that even in, in rural contexts, uh, there's a confluence of all of these worlds at the same time. And, to f and there's, the, there's the risk of flattening uh, people when we, when we make it either or, or those that represent culture versus those who don't um, represent it, uh, uh, as though there are people who operate outside of cultural parameters when we are when we are always located within them and and how we can do how we do it 
in 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 complicated nuanced ways and how we orient to in space at different times yeah but i'm sure other colleagues uh, have more eloquent ways of, of talking about it i'm i'm taking the liberty of actually asking some of our panelists to to respond to that um, marina would you be able would you like to respond to that question uh -huh. Marina? Can you hear me? Sorry. I don't know. Wait. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Scott. Hi. Sorry. Hi. We can hear you fine. Yeah, sorry. I um, I don't know. I was wondering where the question comes from. So I want to ask a part the 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 person who asked it. Yeah, what, what? Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know exact. Yeah, I'm just curious. So I don't have an answer. Uh, That's fine. Juno, can I invite you to actually respond to the question around, you know, how, how do we tackle this, the, the question around modernism, culture, um, judgment, uh, these kinds of things? Would you, would you be willing to share an opinion with us? Uh, yeah, uh, okay, I, I, my camera, I can seem not to get my camera uh, on, but you can hear me. So that's good. Oh yeah, I, I it's uh, I have the opportunity now. Yeah, um, I, I think it it very much connects to um, if I think about my own research, I situate the question in my own research. Um, the, this you know these these dichotomies that were also part of. You no, know, I I've, I've I've been trained as an anthropologist, and one of my critiques of anthropology was this dichotomy you know that, that it was based on the dichotomy between the west and the non-west between tradition and modernity and uh in my later uh, later on in my career uh, it became very clear how this um became part of uh, political discourses on um uh, the colonized and how these these essentialist narratives on uh, the identities of the others uh, were, you know, became an instrument in the exclusion uh, of people from the from the metropole and from citizenship. So um, I'm 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 I, I think it's it's very uh, I am in total agreement with uh, what has been said earlier. It's 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 very good to deconstruct um, these dichotomies because they have been so uh, instrumental in these in these hierarchies, and I think they still. Uh, function in if we think about the Netherlands, they still function in uh, Dutch dominant discourse. For instance, on uh, non-western, uh, non-western versus Western allochtonen, uh, the distinction between autochtonen and allochtonen. So um, they, they 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 still um, are, are very influential in, um, in 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 dominant discourses in the Netherlands. And and um, and and they are also yeah they they, they function politically symbolically, um, and 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 uh, in many ways. So yeah. Thanks, Juno. Um, I I know that uh, Fatane wants to respond to that as well, but also that uh, there was a response from the um, from the. Uh, Nadir, are you muted? Nadir, are you unmuted? You should unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Mojaki Gloria actually responded to Marina um, to say that she comes, she comes out of a rural and an urban setting. And I think that that was really important for her. But also I think that it's, it, you know, I think that um, 
Fontenay would like to respond. So I'd like to give her the opportunity to respond to, to that question again. Actually, I want to relate to something that you said in the beginning in uh, response to my uh, presentation in regard to the trauma that many uh, racialized individual or in that setting racialized scholars experiences that and and I want to go back to what Bell Hooks is talking about how many Black African women cannot afford go to the psycho uh, to therapists to the psychologist, and one of the reason is the financial issue. Of course, is uh, is too expensive for many of them, and the other thing is about the room is too wide. And their problem is not recognized. And just going somewhere, just you know, decolonizing psychology. That I guess many of people who are here, uh, you know, can can this aspect much better than I do. But in terms of when you go and you know, when somebody talk about the racism, the structural racism or sexism, and the therapist who's sitting here probably is a racist or sexist, or at least doesn't recognize that issue as a structural problem and think if you as an individual go and work on yourself, then it's going to, everything is going to be solved. And I want to relate to the issue that Nadira, you mentioned in regard to the trauma that you are li living and the um, feminist care, the decolonial feminist care, how we as a feminist decolonial can show care to each other and recognize uh, but we experienced in, in the kind of Eurocentric academia in regard to sexism, in regard to racism, and how we listen to each other, how we show care to each other. And since, you know, when the room is psychological room or the, you know, the society, uh, environmental society doesn't recognize that. And how that everyday recognition is important and is a part of that feminist care that we all need. So that was what I want to say. That is not related specifically to that question, but something that you raised. No, Fatima, I think that's uh, Fatine, I think that's really, really important is that even in therapy, and I mean, you know, in South Africa, it has become quite evident that we're a society. Um, you know, with post-traumatic stress disorder because apartheid, we still live with the hangovers of apartheid and, um, you know, majority South Africans live um, with in abject poverty and th the realities are there and there's this violence that continues, continuously perpetuates through the everyday racism that we experience in South Africa. So we're a society, as, as South Africans, we we have post traumatic stress disorder and we can't have you know individuals going to to therapists we need something much more structural to actually cope with trauma and of course a lot of uh, decolonial feminist ethics of care is uh, uh, to talk about the kinds of traumas that we all carry but also all the panelists have spoken about trauma um hugo talked about trauma and pushing back you know with queer sexualities um and who know with the the kinds of unbridled sexual abuse that went on in the colonies you talk about you know trauma coming to um sweden uh, as a refugee from iran Marina talks about the trauma of actually doing research where, you know, you have to try and find a balance, you know, do what, do, do we stop doing research because we're, we're, we're privileged because of race or whatever, class circumstances, how do we end up actually collapsing some of those things to be able to do research that is relevant, but that is respectful, that is ethical, that has, that is based on the principles of a decolonial feminist of care, uh, feminist ethics of care, which is really very much rooted in recognition processes, uh, in the ways in which we earn the right uh, to be human. And that is what Ubuntu is ultimately. You, Ubuntu is not uh, giving uh, of the right to be human. You have to earn that right to be human. Uh, and that is in the ways in which we recognize ourselves in the other as well. So, so how do we deal with that when, when questions of trauma arise? Or when we in ourselves as intersubjective beings where we are um, a multiplicity of particular identities that kind of take center stage at some stage and 
and you know at, at other in other instances or in scenarios kind of those those identities are actually kind of parked in some ways how do we deal with these things how would how do we deal with a lot of the violences and silences that we meet in our everyday as you know racialized or uh, gendered scholars or scholars from the from the periphery or participants in scholarship from the periphery how do we do ethical engage scholarship how do we connect classrooms to community how do we do this that actually also disrupts the system that actually creates all this trauma as well so these are some of the questions that i think are very very crucial that you know also having the CISA platform today is also an important um, a platform to be able to ask these questions and to also know that therapy can also um, re-traumatize us if it's not done with the levels of care that is required from the therapist in those moments. So um, it's, I think it's really, really important that we, we, we start, you know, um, disrupting our own thinking around what care means and how we can actually do it. Um, I see that we are running out. Uh, I, we have another Q and we have a, a, a comment in a question in the in the Q and A um, by Miro that says so much richness in how colonialism impacts academic settings and research. How do we do decolonial feminist ethics of care? translate into a contemporary clinical psychology setting is it possible for them to do so and amy nelts oh, i i think we're going to ask uh, panelists to respond to that and then i'll take amy's question in the q a after that is that is that okay how do we do decolonial feminist ethics of how does decolonial feminist ethics of care translate into a contemporary clinical psychology setting is it even possible? That's the question. Well, I, th I think it's hard for us who are not uh, clinical psychologists <laughs> to answer that. So maybe, I don't know if there's anyone, yeah. Oops. Talks about chicken psychology. He says that you know that black women try to support each other through the you know daily experiences. That's why she's a chicken psychology. But as Marina said, none of at least I'm not a clinical psychologist. It's hard to respond to that. Well, what I can say is, you know, in in classrooms uh, that I've taught in, there has been. Um, people have spoken about their traumas and and i and i see hugo's put his camera on and he is you know out of the psychology discipline <laughs> so I, I perhaps we need to throw this question to hugo to see what what he comes up with <laughs> he's resigned from psychology <laughs> Hugo, would you like to to i'm the worst psychologist to ask this um uh on the size platform uh, where I've got to be polite, <laughs> um, but you know, so so I I'm of the school that uh, that advocates for the acknowledgement of all uh, healing systems um, that in fact predate the the clinic in how we imagine it in the present, because there are places where it does not exist and where people function as whole um uh whole people and if we fetishize the clinic as the as the beginning and end of healing uh we potentially then pathologize um people who are not needing the kinds of interventions that we think they do um as as the clinic as compulsory um and and how do we recognize these healing systems that go alongside um, other healing systems, uh, and 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 so for me, I think that it's an important thing for for clinicians to think with, right? Uh, because it's humbling too uh, to to not see yourself as as the the, the fixer 
of of trauma exclusively um, but as as operating within an ecosystem of healing practices um it, it's is uh, you know it's part of the the kind of decolonization of the, of the clinic because then if the clinic it, then it can be porous it can enable and allow uh, because the reality, for example, in the Southern African uh, region is that many people access multiple forms of intervention uh, when they are dealing with something traumatic or otherwise. Um, and often um, the clinic is one of them, but it might be second uh, or third, right? So if, if, it's, if we see it as porous as a place where people enter and depart at different times, then we don't imagine those people as walking wounded exclusively, but as, as using their agency to think more broadly about healing. Thanks, Hugo. I think that that's exactly, I mean, healing is not just about therapy. It is, healing is found, you know, the Nsomi tradition is also about healing, about the ways in which we tell our stories as well in community um, and, and communal healing as well. So there are many ways to do healing and um, this is just one way of doing healing. Um, so thank you for bringing that back to, you know, back to the question around the, uh, the clinic. Um, Amy Nelson asks, Hi, I'm a queer colored psychology student and I'm heading towards my honors year. I'm passionate about decolonial feminism and want some advice on where to study. Are there specific institutions that focus on this and who are prioritizing this movement? Is there anyone I can connect with for advice? Anybody? I mean, the, the Institute for Social and Health Sciences is one place where decolonial feminism happens. The hub for decolonial African psychologies uh, in the psychology department at the University of Cape Town is another place where decolonial feminism is done in the discipline of psychology. Those are two um, institutions that do decolonial feminism in their clinical psychology courses as well. I hope that helps, Amy. Um, I know that we're running out of time now. So what I am going to say is thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am going to hand over the thank you to um, one of our scholars in the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, Noma Gugu Nguenya. Noma is a PhD candidate at the University of South Africa and an emerging scholar at UNISA's Institute for Social and Health Sciences. Having completed a master's degree in psychology at the University of the Witwatersrand, her interests are primarily set in critical social psychology through the exploration of race relations and gender dynamics. Her work often aims to advocate for the inclusion of intersectional identities that are predominantly marginalized or overlooked within the Institute. She's currently working on pro projects that are aimed at understanding healing and violence within community contexts, as well as leading on a campaign aimed at fostering social cohesion with surrounding communities of the Institute. I'm going to hand over to Norma, but I would like to say to my friends on this panel, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening and for sharing with us. I think this has been an incredibly informative discussion and I'm very, very proud to call you all my dearest and nearest. Norma, over to you. Thank you, Nadira. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Um, before I close, I'd like to remind those that it's relevant to, to please um, see the link to register for CPD points in the chat. And uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, on behalf of the Institute for Social and Health Sciences, I'd like to extend gratitude to our esteemed panelists, um, Dr. Huno Jones, Professor Fatane Farahani, Dr. Marina Dur
Professor Hugo Canham. It's been a lot of exciting as an emerging scholar has certainly been expanded by all your insights and inputs, of course, with the aid of Dr. Omaji's moderation. Thank you, Nadira, for your ongoing work to educate on the importance of inviting these ethics into the everyday as we evolve our respective in our respective roles and fields. We'd also like to thank our co-hosts at the Psychological Society of South Africa, particularly to um, Fatima Sidat and Mohammed Kasim, and specifically also to the Decolonizing Psychology Interest Group for your collaboration and efforts in putting yet another critical webinar together. Thank you to Professor Siffler for your warm welcome and Professor Asby for your captivating opening, which I'm sure the audience will agree perfectly set the tone for a webinar of this kind. And lastly, thank you to the audience for your presence and your much valued contributions, which enabled us to engage and reflect further on decolonial feminist ethics of care. I wish you all a good day and evening further.